Beg pardon, sir. Sorry to trouble you, but my orders was imperative. Is this Dr. Ross's home? I am Malcolm Ross. I was told to give you this, sir. The brown is waiting, sir. I'll be with you in a moment. Name? Lizzie. Lizzie Coates. Situation? Scurry maid. Now, where were you when the alarm was raised? I was in bed, sir, in the attic. I see. Now, what was the first thing you saw when you come down the stairs? Nothing. I didn't see nothing. I only heard a lot of noise. Just a lot of noise, is it? I see. Right. Mr. Lawney. I knew you'd come. For anything I can do. Thank you. Thank you. He's upstairs in the study. Come. They wouldn't let me stay with him. Yes, miss? This is Dr. Ross. Your sergeant said he could see my father. Oh, one moment, sir. Sergeant Lord, be pleased if you'd step inside, sir. Please. Please hurry. Dr. Ross. Detective Sergeant Dorr. Perhaps you remember me from our last case, sir, the Mount Chelsea murder. Yes, yes, indeed. Our uh, surgeon's had a look at the gentleman, sir. Raised no objection to him staying where he was for the moment. Often helps us. Uh, that was our surgeon, sir. There's a deep, ragged gash on the wrist. 
Though it's not a knife wound, I'd say. Your surgeon's general findings? Well, he said the gentleman appeared to have be been drugged, sir, though he couldn't tell how. Hmm. We ought to get him back to bed. Do you think that's the best, sir? I do. Right, sir. Right, sir. Right, sir. Uh, my uh, bag, please, sir. Yes, sir. You've presumably reached whatever conclusions the evidence indicates. Yes, indeed, sir. He seems to have been pulled out of bed by one arm, the right, the injured one, and then dragged across the floor towards this safe. So robbery was the motive? So it might appear, sir, at first glance. You seem doubtful. Not doubtful, sir, puzzled. If it was the safe that the intruder was interested in, nothing else in the way of personal valuables, etc., seems to have been disturbed, why apparently having drugged his victim, should he then drag him halfway across the room? Yes, it is a nasty wound, sir. Well, you're right, Sergeant. Well, these aren't knife wounds. They're, well, they're more like claw marks. Claw marks, sir? Well, what do you make of this? Oh, yes, that, uh, that bangle, sir. I have seen such things worn, but... Uh... Yeah, but not by men of Mr. Trelawney's age or station, eh? Quiet, sir. I think we'd better have it off. Can't be too careful. Risk of infection. Hello? I hadn't seen that key, sir. Oh, perhaps Miss Trelawney can tell us what it's for. Or the safe, do you think? Hmm, that's a tempting supposition. And if true, it means, it means whoever, whatever attacked Mr. Trelawney. Was prepared to go as far as attempting to sever the hand from his body. Just for this. And failing, tried to drag him to the safe. Hmm, supposition, Sergeant, mere supposition. Ask Miss Trelawney to join us. Yes, sir. Lorne, would you come in, please? Is he going to be all right? He's in no danger, Mr. Lorne. Please believe me. We've stopped the bleeding, as you see. He appears to have been drugged, but by what means, we don't know as yet. Do you know what that key is for, miss? This one. No. I've never seen it before. At least if I had, I took it to be part of the bangle. An ornament. Has your father always worn it? Yes, as far as I can remember. And how long would that be, Miss? A year or so. I've only recently come to live with him. He travelled a great deal, and I was brought up by an aunt. My mother died when I was born. May I remove the chain, Miss Trelawney? Oh, must you? Well, there is a risk of infection. The wound is very deep. It would also help us in our investigation, Miss. We think it may be the key to your father's safe, and it seems likely that it was the safe that the intruder, or his attacker, was interested in. Have you any reason for not wanting the key removed, miss? No. No, it's just that my father was very particular about his things not being disturbed in any way. The maids were never allowed in this room. Only the housekeeper, and she only when my father was present. Now, would you be kind enough to look about to see if anything is missing? Oh, I hardly know where to begin. I rarely ever came in here. What about the desk? I've seen my father working at it, of course. I took the liberty of seeing that none of the drawers had been tampered with, miss. It seems to be in order, as far as I can tell. It's addressed to me. I think you should open it. These are instructions as to what my father wishes. Commands, in fact. To be done should he be taken suddenly ill. He is to remain here in this room and is in no circumstances to be moved. Thenceforth, until I am conscious and able to give instructions on my own account. 
Oh, Barrett. Would you tell me what it says, Dr. Ross? Yes, yes, of course, if that's what you wish. Won't you sit down, Miss Trelawney? I am never to be left alone, not for a single instant. From nightfall to sunrise, at least two people must remain in the room. My solicitors, Marvin and Jukes, 27B, Lincoln's Inn, have detailed instructions in case of my death. Oh, the gist, please, Doctor. Anything that seems relevant to yourself and the sergeant. The details I could study later. Of course. Uh, the attendants are to be male and female. Your father continues, if I am taken ill or injured, this will be no ordinary occurrence. I wish to warn you so that you may be on your guard. Uh, nothing in this room, curios and so on, is to be removed or displaced in any way, for any reason. I have a special reason and a special purpose in the placing of each, so that the moving of any of them would thwart my plans. He uh, closes with a note about instructions to his bankers. About the key, miss. The key? Yes, miss. It uh, might well help us to shed some light You've on... You've heard my father's wishes, Sergeant. You cannot expect me to disobey them. Well, there was no specific reference to the key or to the safe, as I recall, miss. I intend to respect his wishes in spirit as well as letter, Sergeant. We can e easily take an impression of the key without removing it from the chain, Sergeant. We merely wish to establish it is the key to your father's safe, Mr. Trelawney. Do you think we should abide by Mr. Trelawney's instructions in every particular, sir? I fear, sir, yes. Fear? Why fear? Oh, please don't misunderstand me, Mr. Lorna. Your father has every right to leave whatever instructions he wishes. I imagine his solicitors would tell us such instructions are legally enforceable. But for myself, I would rather we were able to move him to another room. It won't be easy to nurse him here. I hardly think this particular atmosphere will aid his recovery. Do you notice a rather strange, pungent odour in the air. Yes, I think it's the Egyptian curios. Dr. Ross believes your father was attacked by an animal. Are there any animals in the house, miss? Only my cat, Silvio. My father wasn't particularly fond of pets. The doctor thinks the wounds on his wrist were made by claws. Yes, but no domestic animal could have inflicted such deep gashes, Sergeant. In any case, I must examine the wounds more closely before I can be certain. Sergeant, would you be willing to watch my father tonight, as he instructed? Certainly, miss. Inspector Duckworth has placed me entirely at your disposal. I think it would be best if I were to watch tonight, Mr. Lorney. Your father's condition puzzles me. I should like to be on hand in case any change takes place. Thank you, Doctor. You are more than kind. Uh, I should also like to remain in the house, if I may, miss. Perhaps we can divide the watches between us, sir. Yes, indeed. But you, Mr. Lorney, must get what rest you can tonight. You must think of your father. You would do nothing to aid his recovery if you yourself fell ill. I take it you'd like the first watcher, then I'll relieve you... you're forgetting. My father left instructions that a woman be present at all times. Oh, yes, of course. Have you a, a responsible servant whom you can suggest? Mrs. Stone, the housekeeper. Or perhaps you'd send for her, Mr. Lorney. I think it best to tell her as little as possible. I see. Yes. Well, what do you make of it all, Sergeant? In her note to me, Miss Trelawney spoke of an attempted murder. And what do you think? An assault by a person or persons unknown would be my official finding, sir. As to attempted murder, I'm not sure. Yes, but who? The evidence seems to indicate someone inside the house, I'm afraid. There's no sign whatsoever of a forced entry. Did Miss Trelawney tell you it was she who found the body? I mean, Mr. Trelawney? No, do you think that's significant? Her being first on the scene. It is a fact, sir. Well, surely you're not suggesting... An intruder could have concealed his mode of entry and hidden himself anywhere in here. We've searched the room, sir. And found nothing? Well, no, sir. Uh, there is one item that I'd like your opinion of. What's this, sir? That's, uh... It's a respirator, Sergeant. 
An apparatus allowing one to breathe in a poisonous atmosphere. Part of Mr. Trelawney's equipment for exploring tombs and so forth, I take it. He might have had a more immediate use for it. If I'm right in whatever it was that overwhelmed Mr. Trelawney was a gas or something similar in the atmosphere, he might have been better prepared than we imagined. You're referring to the uh, odor, sir? Let's uh, keep this to ourselves, Sergeant. Now, would you, I want to be good enough to let me look at your notes on the case to date. I have no wish to question Mr. Lawney further, or anyone else for that matter. Well, sir, it's uh, most irregular, strictly speaking. But I don't think I need to stand on ceremony where you're concerned. Thank you, Sergeant. Mrs. Stone, gentlemen, anything I can do to help the master, sir. I have been dreaming, I think. I woke with a start, thinking I heard a noise from my father's room. My bedroom is next to the study. No, I can't describe the sound. Whether it was real or imagined, I don't know. As I said, I woke suddenly and felt very frightened. My father sometimes works far into the night, and he hates to be disturbed in any way. So I crept to his door and listened. I heard a strange, heavy dragging sound and a slow, labored breathing. Summoning up such courage as I have, I opened the door. I saw what you see now. My father unconscious and bleeding on the floor. An odd, musty smell hung about the room. An odd, musty smell. An odd, musty smell. <laughs> I don't know what to say, sir. I thought you were... I don't really know what I thought, I sir. I should have warned you about the respirator, Sergeant. Think no more of it. I must have fallen asleep. Oh, how could you? Father! He seems little the worse, thank God. His trance-like condition is more pronounced, but that's only to be expected. He's inhaled more of whatever it was that initially overcame him. But it is highly potent, there can be no doubt, Sergeant. There are no fresh wounds on the wrist. The bandages have been torn. But... I imagine now, miss, you'll take my advice and let us move your father to another room. No, Sergeant, I am bound by my father's instructions. But whatever it is that drugged him, miss, seems to be located in here. Can I... we compromise, Miss Trelawney? Since it appears that the theft of what we take to be the key to your father's safe has been the object of both of these attacks, won't you give us your permission to remove it and put it in some more secure place? Your bank, perhaps? No, Dr. Ross, I cannot. Oh, you are cruel to us, this of me. I must abide by my father's instructions. I must. I must. I only want to be of help. Please believe me. Then help me to do what must be done. I find it far from easy. I'm yours to command. What? What are the housekeepers, sir? This is Stern. A cataleptic trance. Like my father. If I hadn't been wearing the respirator, she'll come to no harm, though. Do you notice it, too? Yes, sir. The smell, it's stronger this time. Mr. Loney, what awakened you on this occasion? I don't know. I woke and felt my father was in some kind of danger. And how long were you in this room before you gave the alarm? A, a matter of seconds, Sergeant. We must get Mrs. Stone back to her room. I will watch in her place. 
And I'll take over from you, sir. Thank you, Sergeant, but no. My recent experience will stand me in good stead, should... You, Miss Trelawney, must wear the respirator. No, I couldn't. I suffer from claustrophobia. I couldn't bear it. I see. I will fetch someone to take Mrs. Stone to her room. Thank you. She's cool, certainly, sir. Remarkably cool. She bears up wonderfully well. How does it happen, Sergeant? Where does it come from, this miasma? When it's light, Sergeant, you and I will search this room with the utmost care. Somewhere. Somewhere there must be a clue. What's underneath here? I don't know, sir. The room below is locked, and the housekeeper doesn't have the key. She said Mr. Trelawney used it as a workroom, but he would allow no one inside. Well, don't worry, Miss Margaret. We'll take care of Mrs. Stone. Miss Trelawney, the room below this one, have you a key to it? No. Why do you ask? I think it may give us a clue. Dr. Ross, my father never allowed anyone in that room, not even me. I always respected his privacy. I must do so even more zealously now. But, Miss Trelawney... That room will remain as he left it. What's that? Hands off me! That's all. I just want to ask you a few questions. That's all. That's enough of that. Now. Well, Rogers. And of outside, Sergeant, in the shrubbery, challenged him. He ran off. Caught him. He put up a struggle. Refused to give name or address. And what were you up to out there, eh? Let me go, damn you! You let me go! Handcuffs, Rogers. So what have you got to say for yourself? My business is with Mr. Trelawney. Him and no other. I am Margaret Trelawney. What is your business with my father? Good God. No. It can't be. <laughs> What don't you believe? My business is with Mr. Trelawney. I must see him at once. Well, that's impossible. Well, what's it to be? Some sort of explanation now or a night in the cells? No. No, there's no time to be lost. It's imperative I see Mr. Trelawney now. That's quite out of the question. My father has been taken ill. Ill? What's wrong with him? You ask us to share a confidence with you, sir, yet you are unwilling to tell us who you are. And the name's Corbeck. Perhaps your father mentioned me. No, I don't think so. However, I know little of his work or associates. I've only recently come to live with him. Well, what's your business with Mr. Trelawney? I'm pledged to secrecy. Well, I respect your pledge, Mr. Corbick, but I also act in accordance with my father's implied wishes by asking you to tell us more about yourself. I assure you, you may speak freely in front of these gentlemen. They have my confidence. Your father sent me to Egypt to undertake a commission for him. My mission was successful. Mr. Trelawney instructed me to return to London immediately. I was to contact him the moment I arrived, no matter what the hour. I was, moreover, to tell no one where I'd been or why, and my return to London was to be kept as secret as possible. But why were you hanging about outside? Why didn't you the come in? The place was in a turmoil. Servants running about, your fellows all over the place. I thought I'd wait until things had quietened down, until I wasn't likely to be asked a lot of damn fool questions. You satisfied? Not entirely. Have you any proof that you're in Mr. Trelawney's confidence? Letters, that kind of thing, no. I was told to destroy all written instructions to prevent them... To prevent what? To prevent the possibility of them falling into the wrong hands. Have you been to this house before, Mr. Corbeck? Yes. Then you know which room my father used as a study? Yes. That room at the top of the stairs. The first door on the right, I think. Your father slept there too, I, he told me, to, just to keep an eye on things. Yes. What do you mean, keep an eye on things? The safe, he had certain valuables in it. Uh, that room below, 
Yes, the room below. Well, that's where he kept the larger items from our last expedition. Sergeant, the handcuffs, would you please? I must warn you, miss, that so far this man has told us nothing he couldn't have found out from the servants. Except when he tells us about a room into which I myself have never even been allowed. But how do we know whether he's right or wrong? We have no key. I have. If you'll be good enough, Sergeant. All right, Rogers. May I see Mr. Trelawney now? Let's try the key first, sir. No, sir. I promised Mr. Trelawney I wouldn't part with it to anyone. What are you doing? Now, Mr. Trelawney, have I convinced you? Yes, Mr. Corbett. We have a particular reason for wanting to examine that room. I'm afraid I can only permit that if I'm satisfied that Mr. Trelawney can no longer give his own instructions. In that case, I will use my own discretion. I think you may, Mr. Corbick. You would like to see my father. Come with me. Miss Trelawney, are you sure? I am sure Mr. Corbick is who he says he is. He can and will, I am sure, be of great help to us. When? How? Earlier tonight. Yesterday, in fact. I was awakened by a noise, came in, and found him as you see him now, unconscious and lying on the floor. His wrist had been slashed. You're a doctor, I take it, sir. What's your opinion? He appears to be in a cataleptic trance. How it was induced, I don't know. If you... What's wrong? That smell. What do you make of it? I was hoping you might be able to explain it. I was in here with one of the servants. My father left instructions that he was never to be left alone while ill. A man and a woman were to watch him constantly. A man and a woman, yes. I was wearing this. We found it in here. Yes, Mr. Trelawney and I have used such things when opening tombs. The foul air. Uh, but go on, Doctor. Well, I must have fallen asleep, or so I thought. The last thing I remember was looking over Sergeant Dawes notes on the case. I heard a scream and a shot. I I didn't recognize the doctor and fired. I I was still half asleep myself at the time. The important thing is that the smell was stronger when I came to than it was before. And the servant? In the same condition as Mr. Trelawney. Do you think the, uh, shall we say, miasma could have emanated from something in this room, one of the curios, perhaps? What do you think, Corbeck? It might. It might. The doctor wondered if it might have come up from the room below. That's why we want to examine it. Sergeant, and you too, Doctor. Uh, there's something I wish to tell Miss Trelawney, but I'd prefer to tell her alone. Would you mind leaving us both for a few moments? I have no secrets from Dr. Ross, Mr. Corvick. However, if what you're about to say would embarrass Sergeant Dor in his official capacity, I'm sure he will be willing to withdraw. For my own part, Sergeant, I promise I will conceal nothing which might aid you in your inquiries. Very well, miss, if you're sure. I'll be on the landing, sir, should I be needed. Yes, Mr. Corvick. Well... Since you know nothing of me, Miss Trelawney, I'll begin at the beginning. I first met your father many years ago in Cairo. We met at a house of a mutual friend. We discovered we had much in common. In particular, we were both fascinated by ancient Egypt. Well, I, I'm no scholar like your father, Miss Trelawney, believe me, but uh, I've talked about Egypt a good deal, and I know the local dialects and the natives. Your father asked me to join him on an expedition to remote Nile Valley. The Valley of the Sorcerer. Sometimes I wish. Sometimes I wonder. Your father told me he hoped to find a tomb in the valley. 
Just that, no more. And I, of course, I didn't press him. Our Egyptian porters refused to enter the valley. Nothing would induce them to set foot inside it. Fortunately, a band of Bedouin were camped nearby and we prevailed upon them to accompany us, not without difficulty, however. We reached the tomb. Its entrance was a natural cavern, high up in the cliff face of the valley. No one would have taken it for a tomb entrance, hence no doubt the very reason why it had never been pillaged, as we were to find. Carved above the entrance were these words, though we didn't stop to translate them at the time. Hither the gods come not at any summons. The nameless one has rebelled against them and is forever cast off. Go not nigh, lest their vengeance wither you away. The priests. What? What did you say? I didn't speak. But you finished the quotation. The curse is only known to Mr. Trelawney and myself. How could you know? My father must have told me of it. With that, nothing else? No, nothing else. I suspect you're being less than frank with me, Mr. Lawney. Mr. Corbett. That's please. enough, Corbett. Yeah, I'm sorry. Well, at, at the back of the cavern, far into the cliff itself, there was a pillared portico of huge dimensions. The pillars were seven-sided and unique in our experience. Sculpted on the architrave was the boat of the moon, containing Hathor, cow-headed and bearing the disc and plumes, and the dog-headed Harpi, the god of the north. Then, steered by Harpocrates, the boat pointed north, represented by the pole star. And, and, and the stars that form the plough, as we call it, were also represented, but they were cut larger than the rest and gilded. Then, in the chamber, we found the stele, or, or record. It, it was a great, the stele, it was a great slab of lapis lazuli, low down on, on the western wall. And this slab of, of, of lapis lazuli with, was covered with hieroglyphics. And the inscription began. Terra, queen of the Egypts, daughter of Antef, monarch of the north and south. Daughter of the sun. Queen of the diadem. Well, what's all this got to do with Trelawney? Uh, Mr. Trelawney and I removed certain items from the tomb. I'm, I mean, that he had some reason, some purpose for doing so, I don't doubt, but he didn't confide that purpose to me. Well, where are these items now? They're here, uh, and in the room below, the larger items. But I, I must warn you, however, that all the evidence seemed to suggest that a terror was feared, and not only in life, but also perhaps, perhaps even more, in death. Alone of the Egyptian queens, she claimed full male pharaoh status. I mean, we found the entwined Harjit and Desha, the red and white crowns of Upper and Lower Egypt on her stele. She was ambitious. The priests feared her. Yes, yes, but not without reason. You see, the only females entitled to both crowns were deities, goddesses. She alone, of all the rulers of ancient Egypt, claimed the power to compel the very gods themselves. Uh, and the gods are, are both the upper and lower worlds. Well, it's an unthinkable blasphemy. Uh, unless... Unless... Let us return to more mundane matters. Corbeck, are you ready to show us the workroom? Yeah. Yes. Good. Miss Trelawney, shall oh, we... Oh, I shall remain here with my father. It's too late to wake the servants again. Would you ask Sergeant Daw to watch with me? Yes, of course. Mm. 
Chaloni had this room made to look like Terra's tomb. This is her sarcophagus. What happened to the hand? It was cut off by some of our Bedouin. They returned to the tomb unknown to us before we had a chance to move her. They were dead when we found them near our camp, strangled. Their wounds and the gashes on Mr. Trelawney's wrist seemed to me to be inflicted with the same. No, I, I surmise. What are you trying to say? No, I, I digress. And the hand, which like the face was unwrapped again, Unique. It lay covering a ruby of enormous size and brilliance. It was this that first attracted the Bedouin. After we found their bodies near our camp, we returned to the tomb. The severed hand and the jewel had been replaced. The jewel is now, or was when I last saw it, in Mr. Trelawney's safe. Then it was the jewel that... Yes. And the hand. Mr. Trelawney has it. A wearer, I don't know. you see those symbols? Yes. They show that her body is immortal and transferable at will. She commands every element. And so she believed living in an age of the darkest superstition, but we... <clears throat> She's evil. She's evil incarnate. I lied to you, Dr. Ross, when I said I didn't know what Mr. Trelawney's purpose was in reassembling the furnishing of Terra's tomb. I do know. He told me when I was last in London. He means to reincarnate her. To set loose upon the world a being so evil as our own sorcerers, for whom evil itself was good and good evil. Blotted out her very name and cursed forever any who might look upon her, let alone those who, like us, seek that she may live again. Live again? And yet we may be too late. Is she already among us? Is Miss Trelawney herself terror? You don't know what you're saying. You couldn't believe your own eyes when you first saw her. No more could I when minutes ago in the hall in this very house I saw Miss Trelawney. That face unchanged in the smallest detail. An echo reverberating down 3,000 years. Well, there is a likeness, it is true, but... Oh, tell me, Corbeck. If Trelawney had everything he needed for his experiment, why didn't he go ahead? He lacked one thing, the lamps. He, he guessed they were hidden in the tomb, and he sent me to Egypt to find them more than a year ago. And? I found them. Oh, God forgive me, I found them. Well, why were the lamps so important? I don't know, he wouldn't tell me. But without them, the experiment could not take place. And where are they now? But that I can't tell you, sir. And I pray to God I should never have to tell anyone. The smell you noticed in the study, it was familiar to you? Yes, sir. On our second visit to the tomb, we didn't think it necessary to wear our respirators. We must have been overcome, though neither of us remembered anything. We only realized something was wrong when we got back to our camp. The Bedouin had given us up for lost. They told us we'd been gone four days. The only strange thing I noticed on that occasion when leaving the tomb was a heavy, pungent odor in the air as there was upstairs, just now. Did either of you suffer any after effects? No. Shall we?
Oh, excuse me, sir. Dr. Ross, may I say how grateful I am for all you've done for my poor father? What is it? Oh, oh, it's only my birthmark. I'm sorry. Oh, forgive me, please. Please forgive me. Excuse me, sir. Could I have a word with you? Outside, please. I'll stay, Doctor. Excuse me. Miss Trelawney, does the name Terra mean anything to you? No, Mr. Corbick. Should it? You, your father... Uh, your father and I opened her tomb many years ago. She was a queen of ancient Egypt. And I had reason to believe. Uh, your father wrote to me a, a, a week or so ago uh, and asked me, uh, should anything happen to him, for me to take charge of the contents of the tomb. He mentioned no such thing in his letter to me. Ah, no. no. I, of course, I, I no longer have his letter. I destroyed it as I did all his other documents. According to his wishes, I realize you can't take my unsupported Mr. word. Corbick, you are my father's confidant. I trust you as I would him. My only regret is I know so little of my father's business affairs. You, Mr. Corbick, know so much more. So much more. We know absolutely nothing about him, Doctor. He's produced no proof of his identity, no letters, no papers, nothing. He had the keys to the workroom. Well, he could have stolen it. From the real Corbeck, perhaps. Now, how, how do we know he's not an imposter? Surely Mr. Trelawney's secrecy, the precautions he took, everything points to a motive for imposter. What are you implying, Sergeant? An accomplice inside the house could have made sure Corbeck ran no risk of being unmasked by drugging Mr. Trelawney. Because he's the only one who knows the real Corbeck. With a drug unknown to medical science? Ah, but if his story was in part true, and he was in Egypt until recently, which could well be. He could have got hold of something, some oriental drug. The Trelawney was taken ill before. Before Rogers found Corbeck, yes. But that doesn't prove he wasn't hanging about earlier. True. His accomplice, Sergeant, surely you don't suspect Miss Trelawney? No, not now, sir. Good. Circumstantial evidence seemed to point to her at one stage. What could be her motive? She's utterly devoted to her father. No, no, sir. And as for the rest, her being first on the scene after both attacks, that, I'm now convinced, was mere coincidence. Oh, did uh, Corbick, or whatever his name is, say anything of interest downstairs? He told me. He told me Trelawney intends to revivify, bring to life one of the mummies. What? And he expected you to believe him? <laughs> what does he take us for, sir? I'm going to take him down the station. I'll get the truth out of him, I promise you. He, uh... He might put up a bit of a struggle, sir. I think we can handle him. But it might be just as well if the young lady wasn't present. It might distress her. Perhaps you could ask her to leave us when we go in. A sensible precaution, Sergeant. Right, sir. Miss Trelawney, would you be good enough to leave us alone for a few moments? You're forgetting, Doctor. My father left instructions that a woman be present at all times. Only from nightfall to sunrise, wasn't it, Miss? It's daylight now. Yes. If you'll excuse me, gentlemen, I'll order an early breakfast. Shall we meet in the morning room? Right, Mr. Corbeck. I must ask you to accompany me to the station for questioning. Look. What? In the box. She gave it me. Come on, outside.
It's hers. Terrors. But you knew it was here. You said so. Mr. Trelawney would never just leave it. We, we guarded it with our lives. Come on. You must let him take me, Doctor. You know nothing of this business. Without me, you'll be at her mercy. Who are you? What are you doing here? You will pick up the lamps this morning, Corbeck, and then this evening we will prepare ourselves. Twenty years, twenty long and arduous years, and now at last we're ready. Ready, Corbeck. Well, don't you think we should wait, sir, uh, until you're fully recovered? Nonsense. There's nothing whatever the matter with it. Now then, Corbeck, the lamps. What time does a safe deposit open? At nine. Good. Henry will drive you. Take the fly. It'll be quicker. Uh, Trelawney, your daughter. Margaret, I didn't know she had it in her. Kept her head, I gather. Behaved splendidly. <laughs> By the way, Corbeck, do you think there's something between her and this uh, doctor fellow? Uh, I don't know. Could do worse. A lot worse. Well, she'll tell me when she thinks I ought to know. <laughs> Have you noticed the strange similarity between her and... Terror? Noticed? When I returned here after all these years and saw her growing up for the first time, I could hardly believe my eyes. It was astonishing. Well, th then surely you... There's more to that resemblance, my friend, than even you know. Margaret was born at the exact moment we first laid eyes on Terra. What do you make of that? A sign, a portent, and Terra has marked her for her own. Have you seen it? Her birthmark here. You remember those Bedouin savages severed Terra's wrist to get at the jewel? Margaret bears the marks of that brutality. I, I take it you have mentioned Terra to her, sir. I'm, and, she, and she knows what we mean to do, and why, and how. No. <laughs> oh, no. Well, then how can she know so much? Terra, it is, I am convinced, Terra who speaks through her. I have questioned her closely on several occasions, but she remembers nothing of what she said or how she came to say it. What did she say that surprised you, Corbeck? The priest's curse. Go not nigh, lest their vengeance wither you away. The last line, she repeated it word for word. Yet only you and I know the words, Trelawney. Small wonder that impiety should rankle. Blasphemy. But she has triumphed. Her persecutors are dust before the desert wind. She will live again. Her learning, her knowledge, her skills, all will be ours. Ours, Corbeck, ours alone. We stand on the threshold of the millennium. And she was evil. I, I mean, her, her own priests. And Copernicus and Galileo, what did the priests say of them? Envy, calumny, persecution was a lot of those noble spirits as it was hers, terrors in an age of even darker superstition. Come in. Oh, excuse me, Father. Not at all, my dear. Corbeck was just leaving. Father, the servants have all given notice, all except Mrs. Stone and Henry. Well, your illness and the general upset seems to have worried them. Just as well. We don't want a pack of frightened servants under our feet tonight. Perhaps your doctor, Ross, would lend us a hand. With what, Father? Come, think hard. Have you no clue what we're about to do tonight? Come, think, Margaret, think. <laughs> no. No, none. Oh, my dear child, don't upset yourself. I was only teasing that you are tired and overwrought. Forgive me for being so thoughtless. <laughs> Tell me, is that policeman still here? Oh, yes. He wants to speak to you. Oh, I have no time to answer his damn fool questions. Ask him to leave the house, will you? Uh, no, I'll tell him myself. I don't want him hanging about the place. Where is he? He's in the morning room with Dr. Ross. Ah. The lamps, Corbeck, as soon as the safe deposit opens, eh? And then straight back here and we'll hold a council of war. <laughs> you know what the date is? 30th, 31st. And the month? July. 
the fourth month of the season of inundation, ruled by Ra, the Sun God. And today is the seventh day of that month. Their month beginning on our 25th. So it must be tonight, the night of the mystic seventh. The month of Ra, in the personification of Harmachi, the bringer of light. And how are you this morning, Mrs. Stone? Oh, I'm quite recovered, thank you, sir. Good. The funny thing is, I can't remember anything about it. Is your work here complete, Sergeant? Yes, sir. After I've seen Mr. Trelawney and written up my report. Would you be prepared to stay on here until Mr. Trelawney has finished his experiment, as he calls it? I've no right to ask you to do so. It is in my house, but I'd feel a good deal happier. Uh, I'm sure Inspector Duckworth would understand if I were to ask him. Well, sir, I don't know what my official position would be, but yes, I'd like to stay on and see it through. The experiment, I mean. Good. Now, Mr. Trelawney may well not be agreeable to your staying, Sergeant. Would it be possible for you to suggest, uh, no more than suggest, that you were here in the line of duty? I should support you, needless to say. Yes, I think so, sir. Of course, should Mr. Trelawney order me out of the house, I'd have to go. I would be trespassing. I realize that. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Now then, uh, Constable. Uh, Sergeant, sir. Ah, oh, yes, Sergeant, of course. Do sit down, Dr. Ross. Sergeant. I am most grateful for all you've done for my daughter and for me, of course, but I really must not detain you any longer. <laughs> I'm sure the doctor will bear me out when I say that my illness is entirely due to uh, natural causes. Oh, I'm not sure I can, sir. I'm as puzzled now as I was when your daughter sent for me as to its cause. That may be, but what I'm saying is it's no longer a matter for the police. You were attacked, sir. That wound on your wrist, let alone anything else is serious enough for a grievous bodily harm charge. Yes, but who? Who are you going to charge? I don't know, sir, yet. But that's no reason to stop looking. On the contrary. I see. Where do you stand in all this, Doctor? Well, Sergeant Dorr has, I think you will agree, sir, shown himself to be a zealous and capable officer, and above all, a man of infinite tact and good sense. In your place, sir, I'd much rather he stayed and continued his investigations than run the risk of his place being taken by another Officer, or officers who may well be more intrusive. <laughs> Very well, stay, Sergeant, but be so good as to keep out of the way as much as possible. I'll endeavour to do so, sir. Uh, good. Now then, when Excuse Corby me, comes sir, may back, I put uh, a fresh dressing on your wrist while we talk out my back, yeah? Yes, yes, if you like. Uh, thank you, Sergeant. You've no idea how it happened, I take it, sir? No, none. The Dr. Ross thought that the wound had been inflicted by a cat. It was a cat, wasn't it, sir? A cat? Preposterous. I said, if you remember, Sergeant, that the wounds looked as if they were claw marks. You see, they are the result of lateral pressure. The wound is at its deepest where the skin was first punctured. Sergeant, hold this clean piece of lint on the wound, will you? Yes, sir. I shan't be a second, sir. What? What is it, man? Where are you going? I can't sit here like this. Oh. A cat. A cat, if you please. Poppycock. <laughs> Come along, Doctor. What are you up to? Good God. What do you think you're doing with that? Where did you get it? Who gave you leave to search my study? Answer me, sir. Uh, Corbett gave it to me. Margaret showed it to him. Nonsense. No one knew where it was but me. I'm sure Corbett can explain, sir. He'd better. Now. Let me have it. Come. May I see your wrist, please? The right one. 
Why? I just want to put a theory to the test. Oh, very well. But only if you'll swear to me that you'll give me that back and never touch it again without my permission. All right. Well, Doctor, are you satisfied? The box, please. Open, if you would be so kind. Would you continue with your bandaging, Doctor? Yes, of course. Dr. Ross, if the fingers of the hand had matched the wounds on my wrist, what would that have proved, do you think? Sit down, my dear fellow. Uh, first of all, Dr. Ross, let me welcome you formally into our household. Uh, from what Margaret tells me, I gather it may not be long before I can welcome you permanently into our little circle. I beg your pardon, sir. You have not spoken, I know. Margaret has done so for you. Not etiquette, I allow, but we Trelawn is our impulsive. We make, we do not abide by the rules of polite society. Do you deny her allegations? Uh, no, indeed not, sir. <laughs> then you have my blessing. <laughs> Mr. Lorney. The time enough for pretty speeches, Ross, when tonight is over. Now, I understand from Corbeck that you know something of our intentions. Something, yes, sir. We are privileged. You realize that, Ross? Highly privileged. Let me be frank. You would have no place here among us now had Margaret not pressed for your inclusion. And as a dear girl knows, I can deny her nothing. What exactly are you going to try and do, sir? We are going to recall from that state we mortals know as death, Terra, Queen of Egypt, mistress of the sacred sign, Known only to the gods themselves, she was and is partaker in their divinity. Stop! Stop, Trelawney, I beg you! Think what you will unleash on an unsuspecting, defenceless world! Who will? Who could subdue her now, as did the magician priest of old? No, they are gone, forgotten, her persecutors. For her a new day, a new age dawns, as she foretold. An age which will come to recognize her awful greatness, her divinity. She was evil, evil incarnate. The steely itself accuses her of every blasphemy. Calumny, the price of greatness. And what of Mohoptet, the high priest whom she slew? No. He died that he might be reborn. She loved him with a love that has endured 3,000 years. She, the immortal, takes on mortal guise for him and him alone. Uh, uh. It's too late, Corbeck. You can't withdraw it now. You realize that?
only I hadn't found the lamps. If only I'd had the courage to defy you. Uh, I thought you'd listen to reason after all this happened. But you did find the lamps, my friend, and in spite of everything, you brought them to me. She ordained it, not you, nor I. You will be rewarded as you all shall, as if the privilege of serving her were not in itself enough. Now, Ross, let me explain briefly what we are called on to do. Our part is relatively simple. Until now, though I had all but one of the necessary elements to hand, their purpose eluded me. She was not ready when she was. She spoke. It came to me in a dream, and this was the clue. The Jewel of the Seven Stars. Notice the stars carved on this stone. They go to form a group of stars we call the plow. They are repeated on a larger scale. On the magic copper which you saw downstairs in the workroom, Ross. The seven-sided green stone coffer. On the table in front of the sarcophagus. Yes. I believe those stars represent and show the exact positions of the lamps which... But let us continue downstairs, where you can see for yourself. See? The Hekau for the upper and lower worlds, signifying her triumph over death and her mastery of every element. As you see, the stars of the plough are insides on the coffer, as on the jewel. I'm certain the lamps placed as you see them to represent the positions of the seven stars will, but I speculate. Let me say no more than that I believe the rays from the lamps will bring about some organic change in the substance inside the coffer. No, I've no idea what it could be. Every effort to discover a means of opening it have failed. What happens after that, we can only hope and pray. Come, let us prepare.
unswathe the cat. Isn't that enough? Would you set that monster loose on us too? Steady, Corbeck. Of course. Of course. Oh, what a fool I've been. The cat. Tell us, familiar. Your attacker to Lorne. Our cat. In astral form. At her command. Pull yourself together, Corbeck. blood. Your blood, Corbett. Your blood. It was nothing. She grew impatient. She meant no harm, only to urge us on. It was the jewel she wanted. Ah, uh, I, I, I go no further. Unless this monster is destroyed. Forever. No! Oh, no! No, oh, very well, so be it. But little did I think that I would ever see the day, Corbeck, when you would want to betray me. Father, I beg of you. No, child. It must be, though it is not of my choosing. <laughs> see to it, Ross. Please. There is a furnace down in the cellar. What's going on in there, sir? I don't really know, but Corbeck was right. Trelawney is going to try and bring the mummy back to life. I see, sir. Well, I'll be here if you want me. Good man. That policeman, Ross. Where is it? I told him not to leave the servants' quarters unless sent for. Good. Then we shall be undisturbed, I trust. Now, at last. Lamps must burn brighter. Yes, it must. It is. Look, the copper glows. It will open. I know it will open at last. Adela will live again. She will! She must! Oh, Ella. My heart stands still. 
We are here at your command. Reach us, O oh great queen, the climax of my life's work devoted to you, Terra. Adjurute in nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus. Miss Margaret. That was a year ago now. Poor Trelawney and Corbeck both paid with their lives for their impiety. For such, I fear it was. There is, I am told, and I believe it, no hope for poor Dor, the bravest, most loyal fellow it's ever been my privilege to know. But for me, today, this very morning, Margaret is to become my wife. Surely I am the luckiest of men. Last night, the dear girl asked me if I would allow her to come to me to show off her wedding finery before the ceremony. Mrs. Stone, the faithful soul, was full of dire predictions of misfortune should she do so, but soon allowed herself to be persuaded. And so I await my Margaret, my bride. 